Welcome back, everyone. I apologize for the technology snafu on Tuesday. As I said before, it seems like there's slower traffic on the internet. Uh, so that slowed down the upload to YouTube. I apologize for that. But I did get everyone's attendance code. I really appreciate you getting back to me with that. Um, with that said, let's launch into tonight's lecture. I wanted to give a few more observations regarding the Ohio Control Share Acquisition Act that we talked about, at least I talked about it, on Tuesday. A uh, couple of points, just because I know it's, it's fairly dense, and I wanted to emphasize what I think is important to keep in mind as you analyze problems applying that statute. First, unless the articles or regulations contain an opt-out, the law applies. So it automatically applies to everyone unless the corporation opts out. Why would a corporation opt out? Well, as I mentioned before, there may be reasons when um, the corporation wants to be able to be acquired or the shareholders want the corporation to be able to be acquired easily, quickly without this uh, imposition of this delay uh, process that's contained in the control share acquisition statute. Second point, this only applies to, quote, issuing public corporations, end quote. As we know, those are defined, that is defined in 1701.01. .01. It's not the same as a publicly traded corporation. It's a special Ohio definition. The statute only applies to, quote, control share acquisitions, end quote, again, as defined in 1701.01. .01. Third or fourth, the acquiring person has to file an acquiring person statement. And the, con the, the, the content of that statement is described in the statute itself. It's not particularly detailed, but there are some specific requirements. And then, of course, what happens when the acquiring person, assuming they are one, assuming it's an issuing public corporation, assuming it's a control share acquisition, assuming they've filed an acquiring person statement, what, is, what happens? Mechanically, what happens? This triggers a requirement that a special meeting be called. If a majority of the shares approve the control share acquisition, it can proceed. However, there's no guarantee that the control share acquisition will succeed. Remember, the acquirer has to offer to buy the shares and the shareholders have to agree to sell. There's no guarantee that the acquirer will obtain the critical mass needed in order to effect a change of control. And also keep in mind, once a acquirer makes overtures to the target company, it can call the whole thing off and enter into a negotiated transaction with the corporation and its shareholders. And the final point is that once the, all of these things happen, they've teed up the special meeting, let's say it's approved by the shareholders, the deal has to be consummated within 360 days. So just kind of a recap of what I think are the, the most important points of the control share acquisition statute that you might wanna keep in mind. All right, let's move on and talk about the next chapter in the takeover story. I mentioned on Tuesday that the control share acquisition statute is, is a legislative enactment, a manifestation of policy uh, that attempts to slow down a control share acquisition ostensibly for the purpose of giving target management and shareholders um, sufficient time to, to adequately consider the offer uh, for all the reasons we talked about before, that is avoiding hasty decision-making uh, in connection with a rather extraordinary transaction. Independent and separate from whether the control share acquisition statute applies to a corporation 
whether it's opted in or out, whether it's opted out or that it applies by default, regardless of, of the application of the statute to a particular corporation, a corporation can also enact its own internal corporate governance devices that also have the effect of making a acquisition more difficult and perhaps impossible for a would-be acquirer. These are generically called poison pills because they make it difficult or impracticable for the acquirer to acquire the company. It functions like poison, as it were. We'll see when we get into these that they run the gamut in terms of a variety of corporate mechanisms that address primarily capitalization and voting once an acquirer acquires shares of the target corporation. The first case we look at is Moran versus Household International Inc., a US Supreme Court case from 1985. This was referred to as a preferred share purchase rights plan. This is the first major case we have construing what we've referred to as a poison pill. So what's going on in this case? How was the plan created in terms of corporate governance? Was it a, a bylaw provision? Was it part of its articles of incorporation? Or was it a standalone plan? Who adopted the plan? Well, in this case, it was in fact a standalone shareholder rights plan adopted by the directors. Remember, directors are the ones charged with um, deciding when to issue shares. And that being the case, the adoption of this type of a shareholder rights plan was appropriate. In this case, the directors adopted the plan by a vote of 14 to two, and Moran was one of the dissenters to the, to the, uh, the adoption of the plan itself. Why did Household adopt this plan in the first place? Well, you'll see that there wasn't a particular threat that was posed at the time uh, they were basically they basically adopted the plan um, in order to uh, make sure that if there is a, a hostile approach, um, they would have the opportunity to make sure that the shareholders received a fair price for their shares. So this was a, a preventative enactment rather than a reactive. Um, a reactive adoption of the plan. Why does it make a difference? Well, as we're going to get into this a little bit farther, you'll see there is always the possibility that management adopts one of these plans to preserve their jobs or to preserve their entitlements uh, with respect to the corporation. And it may at, at times uh, prevent shareholders from cashing out at a favorable price. Um, we know about the business judgment rule, and we know about the role of directors in protecting corporations. And we'll see as we get into this that whether an offer by an acquirer um, has been made before or after a plan is adopted can make a difference. In this particular case, the board had considered a, quote, fair price amendment uh, to their internal documents, but um, it had been rejected by some of the board members. So what are we talking about when we talk about a fair price amendment? That's a provision in the bylaws of some publicly traded companies stating that a company seeking to acquire it must pay a quote fair price, end quote, to the targeted shareholders. The formula for determining a fair price may be indicated in the bylaws. It is often a calculation based on historic prices, that is a formula. So how did the household preferred share purchase rights plan work in this case? 
So this is a little bit convoluted, so bear with me as I try to explain it. Upon the announcement of a tender for more than 30% of target shares, each share of household gets one right to immediately purchase one one hundredth of a new household preferred share for $100. And the right is redeemable by management for 50 cents a right, which reduces the amount of cash in household and also gives management the ability to get rid of the rights if the decision is made to sell to a friendly acquirer instead. So that the first that's the first trigger, a tender for 30% of the target shares. That means someone has made an offer to buy more than 30% of the shares. They haven't purchased them, they've just made an offer. It triggers household shareholders the right to get one right of, uh, to purchase one one hundredth of the newly issued preferred shares. Second trigger was the acquisition of more than 20% of the target shares. At that point, if there is an acquisition of 20% of the target shares, the right that we talked about in the case of the first stage of the tender becomes unredeemable. But what exactly does this mean? The target now has to create a new class of preferred shares, which the acquirer now has to deal with, a new class of preferred shares. We don't know exactly what rights are associated with these, but we can assume that they'd have preference as to dividends, liquidation, proceeds, et cetera. And so the, the acquirer is saddled with this new class of preferred shares if they actually acquire 20%. The target shareholders would always have the right and the ability to exercise that right whenever they chose to. These were essentially like options. If the right is not exercised, and there's a later merger occurring between the acquirer and the target, assuming the acquirer has gained enough voting control to approve a merger on behalf of the target, the holder gets to purchase $200 of the acquirer's common stock. We don't know how many shares that would be, <clears throat> for $100. They call this the flip over provision. Now this is really the heart of the case. This is the important issue. Um, if the right is not exercised and there's a later merger, the target shareholders get to buy twice as much of the acquirer's stock than its market value. How would this deter a would-be acquirer? Well, the acquirer gets less capital since the price of its shares is discounted by 50%. And the existing acquirer shareholders are substantially diluted because all of the target shareholders were just allowed to buy a bunch of the acquirer's shares. Per the court, this is the heart of the controversy in this case, this flip over provision. Moran, a director of household and a shareholder of household's largest shareholder, initiates the suit. What is his motivation in attacking the rights plan? Well, perhaps he sees the acquirer's offer as a chance to cash out at a higher price. This is always the tension, often, well, I should say it's often the tension between um, the adoption of these plans and the rights of shareholders to liquidate their investment. In terms of procedure, the plan was in fact upheld by the district court. Code number one for today's session is the letter W. Code number one is the letter W. So let's look at how this court addresses the case when it comes up on appeal. Well, the first issue is the applicability of the business judgment rule. And the court even says the business judgment rule is the primary governing principle in analyzing these types of uh, shareholder rights plans. And the court says, quote, pre-planning might reduce the risk that under the pressure of a takeover bid, management will fail to exercise reasonable judgment. The court's referring to the fact that this was enacted before there was any pending threat and they are essentially um, deferring to the board's 
pre-planning of this sort of plan as a prudent measure to allow management to take a, a uh, considered look at any approach and buy a possible acquirer. Second issue, were the directors authorized to adopt the rights plan in the first place? So what are Moran's arguments? If you look on page 788, I think it's section Roman three, we see what, what Moran is arguing. Number one, there's no authorizing Delaware law and uh, basically um, and there's no authorizing Delaware law that allows the adoption of this type of a plan. The statute relied on by householder was, was Delaware 157, was intended to facilitate corporate financial restructuring, not takeover defense. What does section 157 say? I'll read it. Subsection A, subject to any provisions in the certificate of incorporation, every corporation may create an issue, whether or not in connection with the issue and sale of any shares of stock or other securities of the corporation, rights or options entitling the holders thereof to acquire from the corporation any shares of its capital stock of any class or classes, such rights or options to be evidenced by or in such instrument or instruments as shall be approved by the board of directors. Emphasis added to that last phrase. Moran conceded that even if section 157 allows the issuance of the rights plans in this case, the Williams Act trumps state law. He cited Edgar versus Might Corp. And, and by the way, this case predates CTS versus Dynamics Corp by two years. The second argument, directors do not have the right to usurp shareholder right to receive tender offers. In other words, the argument that this is preclusive, it precludes shareholders from the opportunity to cash out at a higher price. His third argument was there's no right to fundamentally restrict shareholder rights to a proxy contest. Remember anyone who owns 20% once they own 20%, the rights plan kicks in and it thereby freezes any possible proxy contest. And that's noted on page 790. So how does the court respond to each of these arguments? Let's take the first one, no authorizing statute. This court says, quote, our corporation law is not static, end quote. And they go on to say that simply because 157 does not expressly provide for its use as a takeover defense, it doesn't mean it can't be used that way. Also, they emphasize and, and remind everyone that Delaware directors clearly have the right to issue options in stock, and this is essentially the same thing. Um, you know, again, again the, the concept that corporation law isn't static and adopts from time to time to new developments in, in, in business and in, and in corporate law. The second point, the argument that this was preclusive to shareholders who wanted to cash out, how does the court respond to that? It says, um, the plan doesn't prevent shareholders from receiving tenders. There may be ways that a determined acquirer can, can, can come up with a you know, workaround. For instance, um, tendering to buy shares with a condition that the board redeem the rights, tendering with a high minimum condition of shares and rights, tendering and soliciting consents to remove the board and redeem the rights, and on and on. If you look at page 790, the court kind of goes through what some of these workarounds might have been. So the court doesn't find that as an impediment to, to upholding this plan. As to the third argument Moran was making, that this denies shareholders a proxy opportunity once the trigger, the second trigger has been met, um, the court basically talks about the fact that proxy contests rely on gaining the support of the most shareholders for a proposal, regardless of how many shares you own. Um, in other words, they're not seeing that this 20% barrier doesn't necessarily uh, prevent people from combining interests 80% can be widely fragmented through the shareholder base, and therefore this doesn't uh, 
doesn't render the plan um, to be to be improper or unenforceable according to the court. So did the board meet its burden under this court's definition of the business judgment rule? And, and by the way, how would we characterize that definition of the business judgment rule? The court basically says that the business judgment rule is modified in cases addressing takeovers, since there's always the possibility that management is acting in its own interest. Where defensive mechanisms are involved, which is what we're talking about here, the initial burden is on the directors to show, number one, reasonable grounds for believing that danger to corporate policy and effectiveness exist. And this would be shown by a good faith and reasonable investigation. Sounds like informed business judgment. And the mechanism is reasonable in relation to the threat posed and perceived by the board. And the court also talks about the fact that um, outside directors may play a valuable part in this analysis because they are less interested in maintaining their jobs because they don't have jobs other than sitting on the board. At that point, assuming the, assuming the board can, can show that the threat was reasonably perceived and that the response was, was reasonable and proportionate, the burden shifts back to the plaintiff, who of course has the ultimate burden of proof, to prove that the directors have breached their fiduciary duty. What did the court find here? The court finds that the mechanism was reasonable in relation to the threat posed. There's no allegation of bad faith or entrenchment, and the business judgment rule appeared to have been informed, a la Van Gorkum. So, just summing up, Moran was an example of a shareholder rights plan where the corporation adopts a defensive mechanism that allows for issuance of share purchase rights by the target shareholders, thereby making the target a less attractive takeover candidate for the reasons we talked about before. What if, despite the existence of such a defensive mechanism, the acquirer succeeds in gaining control of the target? What happens to the shareholder rights that were already in place? For instance, the share purchase rights. This next case looks at another defensive mechanism used by corporations sometimes, a provision that basically provides as a matter of corporate governance, that the target shareholder purchase rights can only be undone by the directors who originally adopted it, thereby defeating the strategy of gaining board control and replacing the board. The cases refer to these types of provisions as uh, delayed hand or dead hand, meaning rights can only be redeemed by continuing directors, or no hand, has a fixed delay before rights can be redeemed and that can be can be done by the directors. So these are the this is the terminology we see in the cases. Delayed hand, dead hand, no hand. And I I admit the cases are a little clear, unclear at times by mixing these up, but hopefully we can clarify it as we talk about these further. Let's talk about the mentor graphics versus quick turn case. This is the Delaware Chancery Court case from 1998 involving a, quote, no hand rights plan. That is, it has a fixed delay before the rights can be redeemed by the uh, directors after the acquisition takes place. So what's going on here? Mentor was the acquirer, quick turn was the target. Mentor was an Oregon corporation, Quick Turn, a Delaware corporation. They were both publicly traded, uh, listed on NASDAQ. We see from the facts that there was an underlying patent infringement dispute between the two companies, and the end around was to simply acquire the, the target that owned the the patent so they could avoid uh, accusing being accused of infringing it. 
Eventually, this became an unsolicited cash tender offer for all of the outstanding shares of QuickTurn uh, for $12.12 per share, which was a 50% premium over QuickTurn's immediate pre-offering price. It was intended that there would be a second step merger after the critical mass was, was achieved in the tender. Uh, so they, they would elect um, directors that would approve the acquirer merging with the target corporation. And part of this also was a uh, planned proxy solicitation to replace the board, of course. They would acquire shares, they would start to solicit other shareholders who hadn't tendered uh, to vote in favor of the merger. Um, this, was the, um, this was the threat that was perceived by the Quick Turn Board. In contrast to the prior case, the defensive measures in this case were adopted after the uh, threat had been initiated by Mentor Graphics. So in other words, this would be a reactive enactment of these shareholder rights. So let's talk about what those defensive measures were that were adopted in this case. First one was a bylaw amendment. Uh, a bylaw in, in specifically to Article 2, Section 2.3 of their bylaws that delays any requested special shareholder meeting for 90 days. And remember, we talked about how these plans typically involve some kind of a shareholder meeting to, to vote on the proposed acquisition. How does this ward off a hostile takeover? Well, the stock price may increase during this time which would make the acquisition more costly to the acquirer. So that's part of the poison involved, that sort of thing. And the court, in fact, as we'll see later, upheld this actual, this provision of the, of the uh, poison pill. The second provision at issue here amended the existing Deferred Rights Redemption Plan, or the DRP, as we call it, replacing the former dead hand, meaning only continuing directors can redeem rights, with the current no hand, meaning that the rights can be redeemed anytime after a fixed delay. And this was adopted in direct response to Mentor's threat. It delayed redemption of the pill rights for six months. So if an insurgent owning more than 15% waged a proxy contest to replace a majority of the board, the newly elected board, if elected, must wait six months to cancel the plan if the purpose or effect of the redemption would be to facilitate a transaction with an interested person, that is, the entity that acquired the 15%. This provision, if you look at page uh, 796, Footnote 40, it gives you a, a decent um, quote of the language from the plan itself. This last provision, this six month delay on redeeming the rights that were otherwise granted to the shareholders ends up being the focus of the case. The issue here is, did the directors violate their fiduciary duties to the shareholders with respect to the uh, deferred redemption plan. And the court says, yes, they find that they did. How do they get there? The court reviews the, the enhanced business judgment rule analysis that we saw in household. And in this case, they look at what was the threat? Well, the threat was that a risk that shareholders might act too quickly in accepting a plan that might not end up being good for the shareholders in the long run. And the court gives us a nice discussion of the three categories of threats that arise in hostile takeovers. First one, opportunity lost. This is the preclusion effect that we talked about before. You may have shareholders uh, who want to sell and uh, this may impede that. The second threat is 
what the court refers to as structural coercion. Basically that because the structure of the deal, the way it's set up, um, there's going to be uh, a negative impact, adverse impact on shareholders. The third factor, the third threat is what the court refers to as substantive coercion. This is the risk that the shareholders will accept an underpriced offer because they don't believe management's opinion of value. Why might a shareholder not believe management and how they characterize the offer being made by the acquirer? So was the threat reasonably, reasonably perceived by the board? And the court finds, yes, it was. So the analysis moves to the second, second step. Was the response proportionate? According to this court, no. Why is that? Well, because the, although the, the DRP purported to force any newly elected board to wait six months before um, okaying a, a sale of quick turn to any interested party, that is mentor, ostensibly so that the board and shareholders have time to understand the situation. In practice, nothing would prevent even a mentor elected board from selling to someone other than quick turn any time after they were elected. And there were other proportionality problems with this. Why six months? There was no showing as to the significance of six months. And also, if the shareholders already get three months to act before the amendment to the bylaws, why do the directors need six months? So in the end, the court basically sees the reaction as being disproportionate, as being overkill uh, on the part of the board. If you look at the middle toward the bottom of 798, um, you can basically see the court's rationale in terms of why it found this to be a disproportionate response. If you read the notes after this case, you'll see that um, the Supreme Court of Delaware actually affirmed this decision on appeal. Uh, we don't have the case, but uh, I think the takeaway from it is that the principles established in Moran still survive in terms of the board as gatekeeper has to put on a showing that they reasonably perceive a threat of the types that are described in the case and that they've undertaken a reasonable proportionate response. Uh, in this case, they failed on that last point. Code number two for purposes of tonight's four character code is the letter A. Code two is the letter A. At this point, we've looked at the mechanics, the mechanics of a number of defensive measures, bylaw provisions, standalone rights plans, um, as well as some statutes that authorize these measures. We saw the, the general uh, Delaware statute regarding creation of capital, issuance of, of, of options, etc. We've also seen courts construe some of the state corporation laws regarding who has authority to adopt certain measures, defensive measures. What has hopefully become apparent is that management and shareholders can have very real and diametrically opposed responses to a proposed acquisition, whether hostile or friendly. The reaction of management to takeovers is almost instinctively one of opposition. If that opposition is not tied to maximizing shareholder value, in other words, it's solely or primarily to benefit target management, this is what we refer to as management entrenchment. Management entrenchment constitutes a breach of fiduciary duty on the part of management. Historically, managers have offered numerous justifications for opposing takeovers of the companies they're involved with. One example, the price offer does not reflect the quote, true quote, value of the company. Another one is, it's simply in the best interest of the target to just say no. Another one is, the acquirer will saddle the target with excessive debt in cases of leveraged buyout where the acquirer borrows against the target to raise funds for the buyout. We've talked about that before. 
And then finally, you'll sometimes hear objections from target management based on the assertion that the acquisition or the transaction if consummated would constitute a violation of antitrust laws. You know, those laws that, that control the size of businesses and competition. Keep in mind that the reason most companies become targets in the first place is that they are seen as a bargain. They're perceived as being undervalued, typically because they don't have good management. Assuming the viability of the efficient capital market theory, this must be the case. And if that is the case, shouldn't target company managers be restricted in imposing defensive measures that could prevent shareholders from receiving the highest and best value for their shares? In those cases where management successfully fends off an acquirer, but there is a perception that in the end, the shareholders were denied opportunities that might have allowed them to realize the highest and best value of their shares, what we've referred to before as preclusive defensive strategies, litigation often ensues. One case that is not in this edition, but I just want to mention it anyway, <clears throat> it's the Painter versus Marshall Field uh, Company case uh, from the Seventh Circuit, 1981. Here, management, in response to a hostile tender offer from Carter Holly Hale, it's a national retail chain, significantly expanded the number of stores, thereby making the company less attractive to the acquirer. Why would this make it less attractive? Well, it had less uncommitted equity and presumably increased debt to finance the store expansions. Well, not a defensive device of the types we've talked about so far, no rights plan, no bylaw amendment. It still was arguably geared toward making the company a less attractive acquisition target. Um, the shareholders did not agree with that, statute, that strategy and they, they filed suit challenging the director's um, authority and using all the company's cash to buy stores that they might not even have needed. Um, in that case, though, the directors were absolved by the court's application of a rather simplistic application of the, of the business judgment rule, basically taking the position that the directors deemed this to be within their purview of running the company. Uh, we don't have the entire opinion. As a matter of fact, you don't have any of the opinion. But it shows that for most courts, there's still this starting point of business judgment rule uh, presumption protecting directors. And of course, in that case, there was a strong dissent which criticized the majority for this sort of hands-off approach uh, to a strategy that, that arguably was little more than a management entrenchment tactic. You can see why there are lawsuits uh, surrounding these, these types of actions. Now we're going to take a look at, at three of the most significant uh, cases dealing with judicial review of, of how directors address defensive measures in the takeover context. Unfortunately, they don't give us a particularly clear or linear development of, of jurisprudence in this area. Still, these cases are cited even today frequently by courts. So let's take them one at a time. Unical Corporation versus Mesa Petroleum, a Delaware case from 1985. I'm on page 703 if you happen to be following along on this. Um, this, this case, um, I would kind of summarize it as saying the court is coming up with a balanced business judgment rule analysis. So what's going on in this case? Mesa Petroleum launched a hostile tender offer to buy Unical uh, for $54 a share. And this was gonna be financed with junk bonds. What are junk bonds? They were going to pay for the target shareholders shares with uh, bonds issued by the acquirer that uh, basically offer a high interest rate, but that are subordinated to other debt, meaning second in line behind other debt. That's what that's the risk, risky part of it, why it's sometimes called junk, junk bonds. So they were gonna pay with these, these junk bonds for the target shareholders' shares. And then 
the second after that first wave of of, of buying shares, the second uh, there'd be a second tender, a second tier tender. Uh, those folks would be would get highly subordinated securities, even more securities, even highly even more subordinated than the junk bonds. But they were worth um, also uh, theoretically $54 a share in value, at least according to the acquirer. So they would pay with junk bonds in the first wave. In the second wave, they'd pay with something even more subordinated than the junk bonds. And uh, if you look at Rule 14D-10, paren C, paren 1, under the Exchange Act, you'll see that this is considered permissible consideration to offer in a uh, tender offer transaction. So was Unical's defense proactive or reactive? Well, it's reactive and here's how, here's how it worked. The way it worked was, uh, it was, it, was an ex it was an exchange offer where once Mesa gets $64 million of share, 64 million shares, Unical shareholders can exchange their Unical equity for senior Unical debt for $72 a share, senior to the Mesa issued junk bonds. Now, what's the effect of this? Well, it means that once Mesa acquires a certain number of shares, if it gets control of Unical, Unical is going to have a boatload of debt. All of its equity just turned into debt. And of course, as we know, debt is a fixed commitment to repay money as opposed to equity, which is not. And this creates a huge disincentive on the part of the, uh, uh, of the acquirer. And a possible advantage for the shareholders of the target is that now they have something that's a firm commitment to be repaid uh, and not something that's at risk in the market. This plan, though, had something called the MESA exclusion, basically said that specifically MESA could not participate in this exchange of shares. And the effect is that MESA would acquire a company heavily in debt. Well, MESA didn't like this, they file suit. And as with the last couple of cases we looked at, the starting point is the business judgment rule. And the court basically says that Despite that nod to the business judgment rule, a corporation does not have unbridled discretion to defeat any perceived threat by any draconian means available. I'm reading from page 803. And the court looks for essentially a, a balanced approach to how the, how the, the board's uh, actions uh, can be permissible uh, in this type of a, a reactive posture. As we've seen in some of the prior cases, this court writes, quote, if a defensive measure is to come within the ambit of, ambit of the business judgment rule, it must be reasonable in relation to the threat posed. That's the rule we got from Moran. This entails an analysis by the directors of the nature of the takeover bid and its effect on corporate enterprise, end quote. Nature of the bid, what are we talking about? We're talking about the price being offered for the shares, um, perhaps the quality of the security being offered, if not cash. And also looking at the legality of it, perhaps its impact on other constituencies, on the workforce perhaps. Here, the director saw the Mesa bid as a, quote, grossly inadequate two-tier coercive tender offer, coupled with a threat of green mail, end quote. What's green mail? Green mail is the practice of buying enough shares in a company to threaten a takeover, forcing the owners to buy them back at a higher price in order to retain control. And that's what, but anyway, this is how the court characterized the board's perception of the threat. The defensive measure was intended to ensure that the target shareholders received, quote, fair value for their shares. And therefore, uh, this court considers it to have been a valid uh, a valid uh, measure enacted by, by the directors. Code three, code three of the four character code for today's lecture is the letter S. Code three is the letter S. The second case in this, uh, this trilogy 
is the Revlon Inc. versus McAndrews and Forbes Holdings case. This is a Delaware case from 1986. What's going on in this case? Pantry Pride makes a hostile tender offer for Revlon, uh, the cosmetics company, at $47.50 a share. How does Revlon respond? Well, they adopt a plan to repurchase its own shares in exchange for promissory notes. Again, this makes the shares unavailable to be tendered for by the acquirer because they're not out there issued and outstanding. And again, like in the prior case, this saddles the target with debt because it just repurchased all of these shares in exchange for promissory notes and promissory notes are debt which must be repaid as we know. So how does Pantry Pride respond? There's a lot of back and forth, but uh, the first thing it did was to increase its offer to $56.25, contingent on the target waiving these takeover devices. How does Revlon respond? Well, Revlon, the Revlon board decides to seek out a, quote, white knight in the form of the Forstman Little Firm. So what is a white knight? What are we talking about? White knight is a friendly acquirer that companies will sometimes seek out to get out from under a hostile, uh, threatened hostile transaction. In other words, they might be able to negotiate a deal with this friendly suitor and avoid the whole hostile acquisition by the, 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 the original, original acquirer. So what was the significance of this change of strategy from, from defending the takeover attempt by, by Pantry Pride to, to, to the essentially selling the business? Well, Pantry Pride raises its price to $58 now, again, contingent on waivers. And eventually Revlon chooses to close on the Forstman deal for $57.25 a share less than the last Pantry Pride offer. They also uh, essentially gave uh, Forstman what we call a crown jewel lockup option. That means uh, the right to uh, buy certain assets uh, that were held um, by other entities related to, for, to Revlon for, for a favorable price. Oh, and by the way, the sale to Forstman also was a leveraged transaction. And we know what that means. That means that Forstman basically was going to borrow money uh, to, to, uh, to carry out the transaction. And they were going to use the assets of um, the target, Revlon, to finance that acquisition. So Revlon obviously doesn't like this. They file a lawsuit. And... The issue is the Revlon board's authorization for the company to negotiate with the White Knight uh, once the company was for sale, or at least now is going to be uh, for sale. So the, the way the court focuses on this is that um, once the defensive posture was essentially abandoned, that is by seeking out a friendly buyer of the company, the defenses, the issue of the defenses and the technical aspects of the defenses become somewhat irrelevant. At that point, the directors have a duty to the shareholders to obtain the highest price possible for the company. Once you shift from defending to selling, or, an, or essentially an auction, you're responsible for getting the highest value possible. Did that happen in this case? Well, according to this court, they said, quote, in reality, the Revlon board ended up, ended the auction in return for very little actual improvement in the final bid. Thus, in fact, it was, it, end quote, it was actually less than the last bid. And the court goes on to say that, uh, quote, thus when a board ends an intense bidding contest on an insubstantial basis, i.e. share price is only marginally higher, if at all, and where a significant byproduct of that, of that action is to protect the directors' 
against a perceived threat of previous defensive measure, the action cannot withstand the enhanced scrutiny which UNICAL requires of director conduct. Now, we haven't gotten to, you know, you know, we haven't gotten to, uh, I'm sorry, UNICAL, yes, sorry. So in other words, basically the court finds that the Revlon board violated its duty of care to the shareholders by not maximizing share value once it shifted from a, a pure defense to an outright sale of the company. Um, the lesson here is that once defense turns to auction in the white knight scenario, uh, the, emphasis, the emphasis has to move toward maximizing shareholder value. That didn't take place in this case. The last case I want to talk about in this area is the Unitrin versus American General Corp case, a Delaware case from uh, 1995 on page 808. In Unitrin, American General launched an all cash tender offer and a proxy contest to take over Unitrin. Unitrin responded, this was a responsive reaction, with a purchase plan, a repurchase plan, uh, again, making fewer shares available uh, for purchase, um, less cash in the business uh, once it is acquired. And the Delaware lower court enjoined this as a disproportionate response to American General's um, inadequate offer. We don't know exactly how much they offered. It comes up to the U.S. Supreme Court who reverses the lower court. How did they get there? Building on the prior cases we've seen, the court applied the UNICAL, quote, balanced response, end quote, analysis, which basically says that is, is, is the response a reasonable reaction to the validly perceived threat, or is it, according to this court, draconian response? And in the case of a, what's a draconian response, this is, according to this court, a response that's either considered preclusive, which we talked about before, or coercive in that it doesn't allow shareholders the right, the, the ability to um, correctly and accurately gauge the offer. Preclusive, as we said, deprives, deprives the shareholder from taking advantage of an offer. Coercive risks causing the target shareholders to accept the management offer, either due to the structure of the offer or pricing. If you look at section 809, you'll see a good uh, summary of that in the middle of the paragraph. If a defensive measure in response to a reasonably perceived threat is considered draconian, according to this court, the court won't support it. On the other hand, if the defensive response is not draconian, then Unical, Unical holds that the analysis shifts to the, quote, range of reasonableness, quote, analysis. What does that mean? What is range of reasonableness for non-draconian responses? And the court points out that um, the business judgment rule still, of course, applies. Um, and in that particular instance, um, the board is still allowed to aggressively defend, um, just not in a way that would be considered draconian according to this court's standards. And the court basically says that um, this range of reasonableness standard is necessary so that uh, boards of directors can have some, as they say, latitude in, in, in exercising their fiduciary duties to the, to the shareholders. According to this court, the problem with the Court of Chancery was that they essentially, as the court says here, substituted their judgment for the business judgment of the of the directors in adopting the repurchase plan. According to this court, the lower court didn't adequately engage in that range of reasonableness analysis that they mentioned earlier in the case. Like the cases we looked at before, this would, according to this court, fall under the um, analysis we looked at where um, the initial uh, presumption is that the business judgment rule uh, is protecting the directors and making a decision to adopt it. And in order to rebut the presumption, uh, 
the burden is on the plaintiffs to demonstrate, quote, by a preponderance of the evidence that the director's decisions were primarily based on, number one, perpetuating themselves in office, two, some other breach of fiduciary duty such as fraud, overreaching, lack of good faith, or three, being uninformed. And there again, citing back to Unical. Uh, so I see this Unitrin case as reigning back in a court that was attempting to uh, avoid the fairly clear procedure that came out of Unical in, in terms of the shifting back and forth of the of the of the burden of proof in the context of the business judgment rule. Summing up, um, as to this business judgment rule issue, according to this court, it says, um, if the board of directors' defensive response is not draconian, that is, it's not preclusive or coercive, and is within a range of reasonableness, a court must, must not submit its judgment for the board's business judgment. All right, I wanna move on and talk about a kind of a recap of takeover defenses generally. Aside from the cases that we've discussed, our author has listed um, several other defensive devices used by corporations that I want you to keep in mind while we're on this topic of, of anti-takeovers mechanisms. One of them is a procedure that we've talked about before, and that is uh, something called a classified board or a staggered board. You'll recall that this is a provision that's either included in the articles or in the regulations slash bylaws of a corporation. You remember in our standard code of regulations, which you've seen, and which is on our website, there are, uh, there's a section that talks about the board of directors of the corporation and how those directors are elected by the shareholders. In a classified or staggered board provision, that section of the code of regulations would talk about the fact that only one third or some other portion of the board can be replaced each year. And therefore, this has the effect of slowing down a board takeover because you can't replace the entire board at one time. You have to do it over time. And so this, this tends to be a deterrent in some cases. Uh, we've talked about poison pills or shareholder rights plans, which as we know, require the approval of the directors or shareholders. We've talked about, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, supermajority voting requirements for certain transactions with significant shareholders. Um, this would be, for instance, um, in Ohio, there is statutory provision saying that um, if the corporation is going to sell most of its assets, it has to obtain the approval of 60% of the shareholders. Um, that also can be built into the code of regulations <clears throat> so that there's both statutory and corporate governance provisions regarding supermajority high vote requirements for certain types of transactions. We've also talked about a dual class capital structure. Remember, this would be a, a uh, section of the Articles of Incorporation that spell out the different categories and characteristics of the company's equity. Uh, for instance, it has common shares, may have preferred shares, those preferred shares may uh, say that the, the preferred shareholders are entitled to uh, be bought out at a high price upon triggering of certain events, for instance, or that even that the common shareholders can be purchased at a certain uh, certain point in time. Um, again, we saw a little bit of that in the in the uh, Moran case where there was the creation of a new class of preferred shares, which complicated the possible acquisition of the company. And then finally, of course, we've, we've looked at state control share acquisition legislation, uh, like the Ohio control share acquisition statute itself that put the brakes on or at least significantly slow down an unwanted acquisition by, by a third party. And we know how those work. So I just wanted to kind of recap for you these various um, 
anti-takeover mechanisms that you'll see in your practice and you'll see them on tests and um, they're good things to have in your toolbox if you're practicing in this area. Oh, the fourth code uh, for this for today's lecture that you should uh, write down and send back to me is the letter H. The fourth code, fourth character is the letter H. The last thing I want to talk about uh, today is a fairly current uh, example of, of how these things can play out. I'm not sure if any of you are Papa John's pizza fans still, um, but you may recall that there was some uh, controversy surrounding the founder of the company, uh, John Shatner, Schnatter, Schnader, uh, regarding some, some comments that he made that were, uh, uh, I should say, politically, socially insensitive. And as a result, the, the Papa, Papa John's board enacted this, this rights plan. If you look at it on the slide, I've put it up for you. Um, basically, like a lot of the plans we've seen, it's triggered by somebody acquiring a certain amount of shares of the company. Um, in this case, it would be someone acquiring 15% of Papa John's uh, common stock in a transaction not approved by the board. When that happens, um, each holder of one of the rights that would be issued, and of course that would mean anybody other than the acquiring person would have the right to purchase uh, shares of the company. Uh, basically, you'd get twice as many shares as you would normally get paying the market value. In other words, you're getting deeply discounted shares. That has the effect of taking shares out of circulation for an acquirer to be able to buy them. Uh, and then, of course, I went on to say that if Papa John's uh, was acquired in a merger after someone reached uh, the 15% threshold of ownership, um, they would, uh, again, uh, have the right to, eat, to purchase shares of the acquiring person uh, at twice the market value. In other words, they get to buy shares of the acquiring company. Um, this, again, uh, is a detrimental to the acquiring company because they're receiving a lot less money for their shares than they would otherwise. And they want to say that the acquiring person would not be entitled to exercise any of these rights. You'll see that um, Schnatter and, and his affiliates were actually grandfathered into this plan, but once they uh, go above 30%, um, they would be uh, ineligible to participate um, in this rights plan. Um, clearly, this was intended to prevent the founder from coming back and trying to take over the company again. As I said before, as you'll see at the top, this was a press release in July of 2018. A few months later, uh, we have this uh, press release or press report from Fox News about uh, Papa John's founder's reaction to this, this poison pill. Um, and it gives us kind of an interesting uh, background of it. Uh, basically, he's, he's demanding that uh, the pill be undone. Uh, there is a provision in the pill. The prior slide was not the pill itself. It was a description of the pill that the company put in a press release. The actual plan was filed with the SEC under uh, on, on a form called an 8K, which is a special filing um, at a time when a 10Q is not required or a 10K is not required. It's to report extraordinary events between the regular quarterly and annual reporting of a publicly traded company. Um, you'll note that in this second, in this slide we're looking at right now, uh, they give us a little more detail about the poison pill. It included uh, something called a wolf pack measure, which was designed to prevent uh, Schneider uh, from circumventing, circumventing the poison pill by, by joining uh, with other investors to accumulate their position. Um, this was, you know, they kind of saw past what might happen. He could say, well, I'm not the owner, and these other folks may be the owners. They may have a side agreement of some kind. So you can see that there was definitely bad animus going on between the company and Schneider at this point in time. He asks them to 
basically remove the the pill or at least to remove the wolf pack provision um, and as you if you followed this you might know that this was also the subject of ongoing litigation uh, for quite some time um, I don't have an update as to where it stands today but as to whether it's been resolved or not but this is a good example I think of how one of these can play out in a real world situation um, even to to prevent someone who's the founder of the company from coming back in and being involved with 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 owning it or running it so here's what's up for next week um, we're going to have our our third and final hypothetical on tuesday it's going to cover the material that we have talked about this week control share acquisition statute corporately enacted defensive measures and as you know, they can coexist in any particular situation. This uh, is going to have a format of uh, a number of questions that have true or false answers. True or false answers plus explain. Uh, you'll get half the points for that particular question if you get it right, true or false. The other half of the points for that question would depend on how you explain it. Um, I haven't decided yet whether it's going to be based on one fact pattern or multiple standalone fact patterns, uh, but that's going to be the format generally. Um, as before, I'm going to send it to you by email and expect you to send it back within a particular amount of time, which we've done before, so that shouldn't be any problem for anyone and you'll have flexibility on when to do it as well. And I'll, I'll email you about that uh, before, I, before I send the thing out. Uh, the other thing we're gonna handle next week is look a little bit at fundamental corporate transactions. Um, we've been talking, we've used the word merger, we've used the word asset purchase transaction. We've seen those types of corporate transactions mentioned um, in, in our, our cases so far, they are essentially, in contrast to what we talked about this week, they're negotiated uh, transactions between companies to either combine or to uh, sell themselves to, to the other company. And we're gonna go over some very basic nuts and bolts um, of how that works. And um, I think you'll find it useful, especially if you plan on practicing business law at all. It's, it's super important to know how these transactions are structured. Um, I point out the fact that there is a Cali lesson that you might find useful. Um, but aside from the drafting of documents, which are which is a significant part of this, we do have uh, statutes that address things like corporate approvals. We've talked about this before, uh, the idea that there may be director approvals required, there will be shareholder approvals required, there may be high shareholder votes, votes required, depending on the type of the transaction. So uh, I want you to focus on the, the corporate governance aspects of these fundamental corporate transactions, as well as the actual documents we draft, which are not in the statute, but they're in, in, you know, in, in as a practical matter, what causes these things to be consummated and carried out. Um, as before, uh, please send me any questions you have regarding the uh, materials that I'm talking about. Um, you have my, my phone number, you have for phone and text, you have my email address. I will continue to include that in my emails that I send to the class um, as we proceed toward the end of the, end of the semester. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of the evening. Take care, wash your hands, don't sneeze on anybody. <laughs>